but I want to do this model problem nine for you, which is a refraction problem, but it's a little bit different. So a couple of things here. Let's take a look at what we have. Light is traveling the air when it reaches a block of flint glass. The problem is to scale. The light will travel into the uh, flint glass rectangle. By the way, flint glass, second I do, I see something like that, um, I am just gonna write down the ends here. So that's an M of 1.66, N of air is one. So just get that out of the way. So it's gonna go into the flint glass and then out the other side, right? Because light does that all the time. It goes into glass, comes out of glass. Um, so this is a fairly actually typical problem what happens in real life. Uh, you can kind of think of this as a window pane. Obviously it's not a, a rectangle then, it just keeps on going. This is only a section of it. But we're gonna trace this. So what am I gonna do first? Well, actually, I already did what I was gonna do first. I wrote down what the ends were so we know we're gonna need them. All right, what am I gonna do next? Well, hopefully you said normal line because everything in this problem has to be about normal lines. So I wanna draw a normal line exactly at the place where this goes. So I'm making sure my protractor lines up here and here, perfect. And now a nice dotted normal line. And I wanna make sure that goes into the new medium. Boom, there we go. So that's that. So what angle do I care about? Well, it's this angle here. That is going to be the angle that the incident ray makes with the normal line. So let me just, um, I gotta extend it just a little bit there just to make it readable. Okay, so here we go. Measure, 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 10, 20, 30, 40, 44 degrees. So I say 44, I'm gonna call that theta one. Let's say theta one is equal to 44 degrees. All right, so if I wanna do the transition from the air to the flint, uh, flint glass, I'm gonna to have to do Snell's law. So here we go, we'll say uh, N one sine theta one equals N two sine theta two. So this is gonna be, I'm going from air, sine of 44 degrees equals 1.66 sine of theta two. Theta two is, now let's just take a guess. I'm going from a lower end to a higher end. That means I'm going from a faster speed into a slower speed. Since it is slowing down, it should bend toward the normal, meaning I'm expecting my answer to be less than 44 degrees. Uh, I always like to think about that as I'm doing it, and yep, there it is, 27.3 degrees. There we go. Oh, excuse me, I just had a total misread there. 24.7 degrees, excuse me. All right, so let's draw that. I'm gonna use pencil here because I'm not so uh, bold as to think my drawing skills are that great. Uh, 10, 20. Right, if you know, I have this habit of counting over because some people get messed up with the actual numbers on here, but if I know I'm measuring from this place, I just go 10, 20, and then I know that uh, where I'm going. All right, so here we go. So there's my 24 degree angle. And I wanna make sure I'm hitting that point of intersection. Great. And it's gonna go, 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 but then it's gonna get to this boundary and I have to stop, right? Anytime light gets to a boundary and tries to go through, it is going to, uh, we're gonna have to see if it refracts. And this is our theta two. So now what I need to know is, what is the angle of incidence of this ray? So oh, back to it, I need to draw another normal line. Okay, actually let me flip this over. All right, here's my normal line, boom, boom, boom. And then I need this angle, which I'll just call theta three, because I, I don't want to just use the same numbers over and over again. So we need to know what theta three is. Now, this thing's to scale, so I could just measure that. But what should be true here? Well, what's true and hopefully visually apparent is these two normal lines are parallel to each other. Well, why are they parallel? Oh, okay, normal lines are drawn perpendicular to the boundaries. So since these two boundaries are parallel to each other, the two normal lines should be parallel to each other. So if boundaries are parallel, then normal lines 
are parallel. All right, and we saw uh, kind of a discussion of this when we were doing uh, diffuse versus specular reflection. Uh, in uh, specular or regular reflection, all the boundaries are parallel, or the, excuse me, the uh, normalized are parallel to each other because the boundary was flat, if you remember that conversation. That's not what's going on here, but hold that in uh, mind for a little bit later. So if that's true, then these two angles here are equal to each other because alternate interior angles are equal because the ray function is like a transversal. Okay, so I actually now know that uh, this is 27 or 24.7. So I can now, let's call this three and then four, do n three sine theta three is equal to n four sine theta four, right? So that's gonna be 1.66 sine of 27, uh, 24.7, I don't know why I keep trying to do that, is equal to one sine theta four. If you look at it, I don't even need to plug that in because look, that's just the reverse of this thing. Theta four is gonna be 44 degrees. So you plug it in and see that that's what you get. So let's just draw it for completion. 10, 20, 30, 40, four. Okay. And off my ray then goes. Okay. And that's theta four. So there we go. Oh, wow. So that's interesting. If the boundaries are parallel and I start and stop in the same material, then this initial angle and that final angle are the same. So if the boundaries are parallel and the n1 is equal to n final, here it was n4, but you can imagine there's, I could have more layers, then theta1 is equal to theta final. Well, why does that work? Well, it's just the law of syllogism, right? So if A is equal to B and B is equal to C and C is equal to D and D is equal to E, then A is equal to E, right? So that's sort of interesting there. So what practical effect does that have? Oh, okay. Well, if we imagine that my eye is here, so I'll draw a creepy disembodied eye. There's a creepy disembodied eye. And it's seeing this light from that, uh, from that source. Where does this I, this brain, believe that that light is coming from? Well, remember that the brain believes that light travels in straight lines. So it's going to think that the light is coming from somewhere along the straight line backwards from there. Oh, so the brain believes actually if this is an object that light bounced off the object and then the ray went this way, the, op the brain believes that the light came from some shifted over position from where it really is. Okay, well, we've actually seen this a ton before. That's that break in the straw that we saw in that early refraction demo. That's why when you look uh, through a window at an angle, and it's gotta be at an angle, things look a little bit skewed, right? And actually that's how we know that glass is there. I don't know about you, but uh, has anyone ever run into a plate glass door, like a really clean plate glass door? I have. It is unpleasant. Actually, once uh, I ran so fast, I went through one, which was not fun when the glass shattered and then fell on my back uh, for 48 stitches. But anyway, let's not dwell on that. Um, so why was that hard to see? Well, let's remember about the mechanism of seeing. The mechanism of seeing is such that light comes from a source, interacts with an object, that object transforms the light, and that transformed light gets to our eye, right? But if the object doesn't transform the light, our brain doesn't register it's there. For example, if this light source, or if this source is over here, and my eye was over here, the beam would go through without refracting and get to my eye. If it didn't refract, then the object didn't transform the light in any appreciable way. This shifting is enough to transform the, the, the light so that the brain perceives that there's something there. Uh, to tell you the truth also, remember that we have this incident ray. Um, some of that light energy is reflected back. And if I'm looking at things here, I often see reflections in this device uh, because of some of the light reflecting. But we don't see that if we're seeing something head on. 
or if this is not distorting the light enough. The more that this block distorts the light, in this case distorts the path of the light, the more we're going to register it's there. That's why a clean plate glass window, right, doesn't have anything on it, um, and you're running straight at it, is kind of hard to see. In fact, in skyscrapers, um, early skyscrapers, there, there was this problem where birds would just fly into tall buildings and smack and then die, uh, like in, in the tens of thousands. So you'll notice actually a lot of windows in tall skyscrapers have little uh, like um, uh, decals or stickers on them. And that's so that the birds can see that those plate glass uh, are there, or sometimes those plate glasses are tinted um, in some sort of way so that birds don't uh, crash into them because of the way that the mechanism of seeing happens. Okay, so uh, that is number nine. I just want to talk a little bit about um, what happens though. I'm just going to freehand something here. I'm not going to do it full out. Let's say that I had my plate glass block, but the other side wasn't parallel, right? And so here comes my light in. I would once again draw my normal line. And then we know this would bend to the normal because let's say it's still air and plate glass, right? But now when I did this, I couldn't know that the new angle of uh, incidence was the same as this angle. So this theta one, theta two, I would have to draw this normal line and either know something about the geometry of the shape or know it's drawn to scale uh, in order to figure out what this theta three is, but it certainly would not be theta two, right? Uh, in fact, now it's gonna bend away from the normal, so it might do something like that, because I'm going from a higher end to a lower end theta four, okay? So uh, either I know something about the geometry, um, you know, like if, uh, I'm like making something up here, if we know that's a right angle and this is 120 degrees, um, Let's say we know theta two, we know um, this is 90, 90, 120. This has got to be uh, 60 because it's quadrilateral. This is a straight line, that's 120. Uh, so this angle here must be 180 minus theta two minus 120. Let's call that um, uh, uh, theta seven. I don't know, I'm making something up, is equal to theta seven. And then uh, 90 minus theta seven would be equal to theta three, right? Just quarter geometry, or there is spatial geometry here, uh, but that would be a way of doing it. Hopefully it's just drawn to scale so we could just measure that, okay? But there you go. One last thing I wanted to talk, because I, I, I hinted at it, is what happens if the boundaries are not flat at all? So let's say I had a shape that looked like this, made of flint glass, all right? So a shape that looks like that, made out of flint glass. What's Oh, that could never happen. Oh yeah, actually, here it is. I've got a shape like this made out of flint glass. So let's say I have some rays coming in here. Let's say these rays are parallel to one another. So how would I deal with this? Well, what I would do is like we did with a reflection drawing, I would kind of sketch in a tangent line here, and then I would do a normal to the tangent. I would do all this measured, right? Sketch in a normal, normal, uh, normal line to the tangent, or sketch in a tangent, normal line to the tangent. Then I'm going to realize, okay, well, what's happening here? If that's theta one, uh, it's going to bend toward the normal because I'm going from air into the this material. Let's say it's flint glass still, so uh, it's got to be a smaller angle, so it's going to do something like that, maybe theta two, and this is probably going to do similar, something like that, theta two. And then what do I do here? Once again, I sketch in tangent and sketch in a normal, sketch in a tangent and, and sketch in a normal. I could do this a lot more formally, uh, but I just wanted to give you the sense of this. And then I know I'm going from, see, this is theta three, this is theta three. I need my theta four to be larger since I'm going from a higher end to a lower end. So this is gonna bend um, not this way, but further inward right, or further away from the normal, there's theta four, and this two is gonna bend, oh. So look at what happened there, really interesting. Parallel light rays are forced to come together at a point, okay? That's literally what this is. If you recognize it, it's a magnifying glass, right? Or as we like to call it, something called a converging lens. 
and it causes parallel light rays to come together to a point, which we call a focal point. We're not gonna get too much into it, I just wanted to show you this neat application of refraction. Okay, converging lens. Now what's the shape of this thing? This thing is called a double convex lens because it, it bends outwards. Um, I can draw something very similar. This would be called a double concave lens and I can do the same sort of analysis but what ends up happening here, if I draw on, this, if I draw on the tangents here, um, it's gonna bend towards the normal, right? Um, this one, once again, bends toward the normal. Whoops. And then when you get here, it's gonna bend away from the normal, boom, and it actually does that. And so here we have parallel light rays that are forced to diverge, right? This is called a diverging lens and it is a double concave lens, okay? So application of refraction. These are the lenses in your glasses. Now, I drew really dramatically thick lenses. Our, our lenses and our glasses are not so thick. Um, that's because um, the N of this material determines the degree to which the, the light rays converge or diverge. And so we have just manufactured really um, uh, non-normal uh, occurring um, lenses with very high ends that we can manipulate in order to get a various degree of um, diverging or converging depending on what's going on. This is also what's happening in your eye, not this, but um, the lens of your eye is a converging lens that causes the light rays to focus on the retina. That's how the retina receives the signals that it does. So if you have glasses, what happens is there's another lens in front of here because when you have glasses, something is, is wrong with the lens of your eye and it's trying to, to give the lens of your eye a problem. Sometimes your lens of your eye uh, overcorrects and causes it to, things to focus too uh, close to the lens and not on the retina. And therefore you need a diverging lens here to spread it out before the lens over converges it. And sometimes the lens um, doesn't make it converge enough and then it focuses behind the retina, which we don't need. And therefore we put a converging lens in front of this in order to start the converging process, the lens of the eye finishes and then it focuses on your retina, right? So some great applications there of the refraction of light with multiple boundaries, uh, whether the boundaries are parallel uh, not parallel or even curved.